This is one of the giant heads of the Olmec culture, located in the National Anthropology Museum in Mexico City. It's about eight feet tall, made of basalt stone, and most of these were actually found buried within the last hundred years. So whether they were buried on purpose by a later culture than the Olmec, or whether they simply sank into the jungle at this point is unknown. But there are many, many of these. You see the carving, the pitting, and on the back are these curious depressions. Also these very famous little jade figures of the Olmec. You see some have obvious elongated heads. Also amongst the Olmec, there are obvious signs in the sculpture of cranial deformation or elongated heads, probably only amongst the royal class, which is what we also find in other cultures around the world that perform cranial deformation. It was only for the royalty. And then we find the actual examples of cranial deformation among the Olmec people. You can see that these are clearly cradle boarded or examples of cranial deformation. Nothing profound in terms of size of the skull or even the shape. So what we've been able to see is cranial deformation was performed by at least three cultures in ancient Mexico. The Olmec, the Maya, and the latter one, whose name I didn't uh, <coughs> really ac account for or read properly. But it was only done, like anywhere else on the planet, cranial deformation was only done on the royal people, the priestly class, the chiefly class, to distinguish themselves from the commoners. And that's what we find, where we find cranial deformation on six of the seven continents on this planet. And the most common timeline seems to be, for some reason, 2,000 years ago. I don't think there's a necessary connection with that. Um, but also, the most profound elongated skulls on the planet clearly are the Paracas from the coast of Peru. This is the massive sculpture 
out of basalt stone. The figure is Tlaloc, which is the rain god. This little girl will give you an indication of the scale of it. You can see there's been a lot of damage. And the weight of it. Conservatively, I would think at least 60 tons. It was found outside Mexico City, lying flat on its back and abandoned for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and then was finally brought here to the Museum of Anthropology. Doubtful that it's from the Aztec period. It could be Toltec, which is older, or the Teo, Teotihuacan people. We're on the Altiplano outside of Mexico City. It's slightly higher than Mexico City itself. And the site we're at is called Tula. But Tula is a Spanish name. The original name in the Aztec language of Nahua is Tolan. And Tolan simply means city or the city. It's a site that's older than the Aztec. It, it goes back at least as far as what we call the Toltec civilization, which preceded the Aztecs. And this is where we find the very famous so-called Atlantean figures made of basalt stone. So the local explanation as to what these represent are not Atlantean people, they're not aliens, but they're actually Toltec warriors. The headdress, you see snakeskin, and then you see feathers, so that's the symbol of Quetzalcoatl. And then these are thought to be arrows. And then this is said to be a crossbow, a little tiny crossbow whose mechanism is a rubber band because native rubber is grown in the jungles of Mexico. And then the shield on the back because he can't hold anything more than one thing in one hand at one time. And then in front you have the butterfly shape which is the chest plate that protects the warrior from being pierced in the heart with any kind of weapon, and it was made out of obsidian. So again, you see the snake skin and the feathers representing a disciple of Quetzalcoatl. So of course you do have to make up your own mind, but which would you believe? The local story that they represent warriors holding a type of bow and arrow with a chest plate and then a shield behind, or what would appear to be more fanciful, which is that they are aliens or Atlanteans or something with laser beams. Personally, I go for the former and I always listen to local knowledge. This is the famous Avenue of the Dead at Teotihuacan 
outside Mexico City. It was built, supposedly, by the Toltec civilization maybe 2,000 years ago, and the famous Aztecs passed by this area as they were looking for their new homeland, which is present-day Mexico City, what was called Tenochtitlan, which means the place or the land of prophecy or the place or land of the prophets. So it's actually likely that this little pyramid, which was built in front of the temple of Quetzalcoatl, or the plumed serpent, was done so on purpose to hide the, or partially isolate the temple of Quetzalcoatl in behind, because it's likely that it, in fact, was the most sacred place at Teotihuacan, and could possibly be the oldest. The construction technique used at the temple of Quetzalcoatl is very different than the later works that we see, these little pyramidal structures that you see there. Lots of mortar used in construction. So as you can see, this temple structure was built right in front of the actual temple of Quetzalcoatl that has all of this not only amazing carving, but also possibly evidence of megalithic works. So, as you can see, the staircase was made of quite homogeneous material. It looks like it all came from the same quarry. There was no mortar used in that lower section of intact staircase. Then all the material above is very inferior. And again, it's likely that the, the stone on stone contact aspects were original. Something devastating happened to the structure. And then the Toltec rebuilt in the area incorporating the ancient parts. And that's what we find in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, Lebanon, any place where there's an ancient, ancient site where there are aspects of megalithic construction. Temple of the Sun, supposedly, behind us. And now we're approaching the Temple of the Moon here at Teotihuacan, outside Mexico City. Built, supposedly, not by the Aztecs, but by their predecessors, who were called the Toltecs, even though we don't know what they called themselves. The Aztecs arrived later, found their constructions, and said, these people are artisans. And therefore, that's why they called them the Toltec. So what's interesting about the Temple of the Moon, aside from the fact that it's huge, and was a major uh, engineering and architectural feat by the Toltec people, possibly 2,000 or more years ago, is you'll notice the difference in construction technique. You see those very nice cube-like blocks for the stairway. The stairway has, of course, been reconstructed. But they are very different than the form of construction of the pyramid itself, which is quite inferior, utilizing a lot of mortar. And the mortar they made is actually volcanic ash. And I believe they added lime to it to make it hard. And then we have the Temple of the Sun, which is much, much bigger. Massive scale, the footprint, several acres.
another interesting aspect about uh, Teotihuacan is that it seems to have been designed on purpose to have an acoustic quality to it. Uh, and that is why you have the proportions of these big, but especially these little pyramids. If you stand on this platform coming up here and clap your hands, there's an echo. And this was likely where the great orator would stand in order to make pronouncements to the people who could have been sitting in on the staircases and the different levels of these mini pyramidal structures here at Teotihuacan. We're in the pyramidal structure called Cholula, or at Cholula in Mexico. It's the largest pyramidal structure in the world, footprint of 45 acres, whereas the Great Pyramid in Egypt has a footprint of 13 acres. It's not a true pyramid as such, but it's one of the largest earthworks on the planet. So the tunnel itself is not really ancient, but it was a way for archaeologists, likely in the 19th century, to be able to carve into the pyramidal structure and find the different levels, because it's like layers of an onion. Every layer you go into is an older pyramidal structure. The material is like volcanic ash, so it's really easy to, to carve in shape. In total, there's something like eight kilometers or five miles of, these tunnels. of tunnels that they carved. Yeah. Oh, mackerel. So this whole hill you're looking at is a human-made construction. Again, the footprint, 45 acres, whereas the Great Pyramid in Egypt is about 13 acres. So in terms of volume, it's the largest pyramidal structure on the planet. So again, this is, uh, this is the exterior, probably the last phase of construction, but there are other pyramidal structures inside of it. And <clears throat> over the course of extensive amount of time, uh, one was built on top of the other, top of the other, and then on top of the other. This is one of the famous Olmec ball player heads, about 3,000 years old. And Ed, who was our geologist, has just told us that the material it's made out of is volcanic tuff. It's not basalt. Volcanic tuff is not that hard a material. So it is quite conceivab conceivable that even with uh, bronze age tools or stone tools, that these Olmec people could have shaped these enormous sculptures. We're going to see though if there are also basalt ones, basalt being a much harder stone. So here we are in the Jalapa Museum and we'll see what else we can find. So the Olmec are still a big mystery. They are one of the oldest, if not the oldest, cultures in what we call Mexico, dating back at least 3,000 years. They were an older culture than the Maya, the Toltec, 
the Teotihuacan and the Aztec. And Olmec simply means the rubber people, and that was an archaeological name given to them because no one knows what they called themselves. We're in the Jalapa Museum on the Gulf Coast of Mexico, and this museum is phenomenal. Uh, it's a huge collection of Olmec and other culture, um, art, stone, the huge Olmec heads are here, undercover, being protected. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art museum, as fine as any you would find on the planet. And, interestingly, we also find examples of cranial deformation and elongated heads. So this is the Zapotal culture. You can see the flattening of the top of the head here. Then somewhat like we see on the coast of Peru, somewhat like the Paracas, but the Paracas from more extreme. And then an even greater example, again, similar to the what we call the cone heads of Paracas in Peru. So here we have the Veracruz culture, the center of or central area of Veracruz from 600 to 900 AD. And this extremely altered human skull with three suture lines instead of the normal two. So from the same island, or same area, uh, but on an island called the Island of Idols, here we have what a normal human skull looks like. There you have the one suture and another suture there. That's what every normal human skull looks like. But then we have this one. You can see it has an extra suture going from this suture forward. And you can see the shape is clearly altered. And here again from the island of Idols, 900 to 900 AD, to about 1521 AD. And it is missing the sagittal suture that should be running this way. And another one from the Island of Idols, again lacking the sagittal suture.
Another point about the giant heads is that most archaeologists or people in general think that the noses are flat, but in the fact, or in many cases, the reasoning is, be, is because of the shape of the stone itself. You see as I come down, the sculptor couldn't, possibly couldn't project the nose out too far because of the, the nature of the stone. Maybe, maybe this here was the flat surface of the stone because other sculptures of the Olmec depicting their faces show almost typical noses of most other cultures not flat. But it's a circle of fire. When was this? It's, it's una bola de fuego. Hace cuánto, José? Uh, in the year 19, in the 1996, 1996. 1996. Six balls of, of fire Six light? Six balls of fire here wow. in this pyramid. Landed on this pyramid. Uh, in this pyramid. In this pyramid, in, in, in up this pyramid. The people is scared. Uh, the people... Uh, run away? Run away, uh, allowed, <laughs> allowed, uh, no return to to house. T together, every people asking him, what's happened oh. with the pyramid? What's happened with that ball game? Where it came from? I don't know. It's fantastic. But that pyramid had a power. Somebody tell that. Here we have quadcopter footage of the site of La Venta, which is an ancient Olmec site. And my quadcopter called Pachacutec is now approaching an artificial hill created by the Olmec people. Now it doesn't look like much, but the intriguing thing was that when I first started to fly over uh, this hill, I lost contact with the quadcopter as if there was some kind of energetic something going on on this hill and that was actually confirmed by our guide in the previous clip with the red hat. Now the only really interesting things aside from the energetic component here are the Olmec heads and other stone works. It's not really that intriguing a site. I wouldn't go out of my way to visit it again, but it's an interesting place to see at least once in your life because the surrounding area as well is quite intriguing. There's a lot of um, jungle in the area. Unfortunately, a lot of urban areas too. And this is one of the interesting Olmec heads, one of several that are on location. Unfortunately, these are concrete copies because the originals are in museums. But all in all, quite an intriguing site. These, uh, these copies are exact duplicates, um, great detail. And again, you can see the energetic hill is in the background. Um, Hugh Newman's quadcopter as well had major problems uh, initially. So as Hugh Newman was explaining, during the initial archaeological work being done here at Comal Calco, supposedly a number of baked clay bricks used in the construction, especially of the, probably the pyramid we're coming up to, showed different forms of writing. Mayan, obviously, because this is a Maya site. 
but also supposedly old world, as in, um, as he previously discussed, uh, Egyptian, uh, maybe even Chinese, Phoenician, etc. But the museum had no examples. So you have to conclude either that the story is a fabrication or that these examples of uh, writing which don't fit the normal Mesoamerican history have been hidden away on purpose. And what we've seen is that the, the Olmec, there are no really sophisticated constructions at all. There are piles of dirt and things like that. Of course, the, the big stone heads, but no construction of any sophistication whatsoever as compared to this, which is more of the classic Maya work. So this could be evidence of one of the ancient ball courts with howler monkeys in the background. And it's believed that the Olmec may have invented the ball court process, but it was perfected by the Maya later. So what I've been looking for is evidence of the arrival of what is called the plumed serpent, known to the Maya as Kukulkan and to the Aztec and possibly the Teotihuacan culture as Quetzalcoatl. And he is said to have been a light-skinned man with a full beard who came as a teacher from a distant land. Amongst the Olmec, there's almost zero evidence of his existence. But once you get into the Maya and the Teotihuacan and the Aztec, there's substantial evidence because you see these figures with full beards which Native Americans in general can't grow to this very day. So that possibly could give us a date as to his arrival maybe around you know literally around the time of Christ but I'm definitely not saying that it was Christ but that sort of timeline 100 BC to 100 AD. So we have two forms of building technology here, predominantly the work of the Maya, and that's stucco and also baked clay bricks. No stone whatsoever because there is no stone in this area. So that is one thing that makes this, um, this complex kind of int interesting in that it's different to other sites where we see a lot of volcanic stone incorporated, but since there's none in the area, of course, they're going to use what they have, and that's clay and volcanic ash mixed with lime to make a primitive kind of concrete. So we are looking at the plausibility that there was a great light-skinned teacher or teachers who had a full beard around the time of 100 BC to 100 AD. He or they would have first appeared in what we call Peru, and would have taught what would become the Inca, because the Inca more or less formulated during that time. Their knowledge level was way beyond anybody in the area. And then he or they traveled to the coast uh, at the border of Peru and Ecuador, sailed to the northwest, and wound up where we are in this, uh, this part of Mesoamerica, uh, the Gulf Coast area of um, Mexico. And there to the Maya he became known as Kukulkan, and then he traveled onwards northwest into what is now called Mexico City, and there he became Quetzalcoatl, or they.
We're at Palenque, which is on the Gulf Coast of Mexico. Steamy jungle area. This is one of the great Mayan cities. Lord Pakal, who was the most famous ruler, was entombed inside this pyramid. <clears throat> In fact, there's a staircase from the top, which is now closed. Uh, two levels down, staircase down that way, turning 180 degrees and then that way. And that's where his uh, limestone sarcophagus lined in cinnabar, which is a, a mercury oxide, um, is located. And then his body was found, of course, inside this massive limestone box. No evidence so far of any lost ancient high technology at use here. It's standard Mayan construction of stone and mortar, but spectacular sight. The beauty is that it's built on top of a hill, and uh, that's intact rainforest in behind. And this could be the first sign of megalithic elements, as in that staircase. So you see, here's the standard um, technology of the Maya. But then when we get to this staircase, it's quite curious. These blocks might have originally fitted together very well. So if you only have one example of possible megalithic elements, like we just saw, then that could be coincidence. But what about when it starts repeating, like here? In that staircase. So if you have one example of possible, more advanced stoneworking at a site, then that could be coincidence, but now we're seeing more. We're seeing a difference in these two staircases that are right next to each other. Have a look. So, again, standard mine construction. And in the staircase, but when we turn left, all of a sudden we have bigger blocks that look like they could have originally been precisely cut and then were reassembled as you see them now. So what you're hearing in the background is the sound of howler monkeys living in the tree canopy here. Same phenomenon you see at Tikal in Guatemala, another huge Mayan site. So another area where we could have megalithic elements because once again you have relatively small stone roughly cut bonded together with some kind of uh, lime or clay or other material and then contrasted with what you're about to see. So the standard form of construction and then this.
Now we have example number five of something which doesn't fit the normal uh, construction pattern. Above you have small stones, below you have much bigger stones. Some of them still fitting together reasonably well, but it looks obviously like the lower section has been destroyed or damaged and then possibly reconstructed. But you definitely see, once again, someone put a lot of effort into cutting these bigger blocks as compared to the what would one would presume would be later construction out of much smaller uh, things. Also the two buildings that seem to have the larger stones in their construction are in the core of Palenque and that's common. Um, as in Machu Picchu what we find is the core is megalithic. It's the oldest part and then the 90% that was built afterwards by the Inca spreads out from the core and here too. The core so far has five examples of larger than normal stone construction. Everything else is the smaller type and here's final look. So that's the kind of stuff you really want to find. Um, if you see a consistent building style or you see a gradual um, increase in efficiency and quality of a building style then you can say well the, the foundation is primitive and was made by these people and then either their descendants or others who moved in or other influences um, allowed for increased quality. But when you find big slabs like that in the uh, the two core buildings of a place really badly damaged as if something cataclysmic maybe had happened to them and then you have inferior work above then that does suggest that you're looking quite possibly at two completely different cultures the one doing the large slab work being clearly superior to the one that did the regular somewhat rough stone and mortar work there are now more than 800 of my videos at Hidden Inca Videos on YouTube, or sorry, Brian Forster on YouTube, or www.hiddenincatours.com, or www.hiddenhumanhistory.com. And what we try to do is analyze these magical and also somewhat enigmatic places and see if standard archaeology stands up 100% to what we're looking at or if they've missed certain aspects and when it comes to the engineering and stone masonry aspects quite often they miss um, critical stuff that could make these sites far more older and some aspects of the construction having been made by cultures that they have no idea uh, don't recognize and have no clue as to who they were or when they were here.